Samsung's been making high-end tablets for a while now, but only recently have they really focused on this idea of replacing your laptop with a tablet. Full keyboard, trackpad, and a full desktop experience in the form of DeX. Now, frankly, I've never been able to really replace my laptop with a Galaxy Tab in the past, but the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra comes closer than ever before due to huge improvements in hardware and software. So after the last couple weeks of using it, is it good enough to replace any of my laptops? Let's talk about it. This is NOISO, and this is the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra review. Full transparency, literally minutes before I started shooting this video, I got an email from Samsung support saying that they're charging me $800 for a trade-in that I had six months ago. And I got really, really frustrated. But my goal is to not let that influence my tone in this review. I've already written the script, so it shouldn't impact the script at all. But if my tone comes out a little bit more biting, that might be the reason. So I'm sorry in advance. There's an obvious comparison to be made here to the iPad Pro 12.9 inch, which I reviewed last year with the M1 chip. But frankly, I don't think many people are going to be cross shopping between these two devices since they are from completely different ecosystems. Now I could be wrong, but most of this video is going to be more focused on the tab itself with some quick allusions to the, the iPad. If you wanna see a full video where I compare these two devices, let me know down in the comments. But let's just get right into it, starting with the design. The Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra has some of the most premium design that I've ever seen in a tablet, even more so than the iPad. It is incredibly, incredibly well designed with great curves, a very, very solid structure despite how thin it is, and it's got this aluminum frame which is surprisingly matte, even though obviously the newer Galaxy S22 series has a glossy frame instead. I prefer this, to be honest, but honestly, this experience is just what you'd expect out of a very futuristic experience of holding a display in your hands without worrying about the tablet around it. That's contributed to by just how small the bezels are and just how thin the tablet is. Now, this is by far the largest tablet I've ever used, larger than the Surface Pro 8, larger than the iPad Pro 12.9 inch. It is massive, but frankly, when using it, it honestly doesn't really strike me as much. Now, a good reason for this is because, frankly, I didn't really often hold the device up in my hands the way that I might an iPad mini or an even iPad 10.5 inch or 11 inch. Instead, I frequently just had this set up on a table or on my lap using the not included kickstand. Now, this is an interesting one. Last year in my iPad Pro review, I mentioned that the iPad Pro 12.9 inch could use an integrated kickstand by the likes of the Surface Pro line. But unfortunately, there were a lot of people that actually disagreed with me in the comments. Ironically enough, this year, MKBHD and Dave2D both mentioned that the kickstand is integral to the experience of using the Galaxy Tab, considering how large it is. We don't actually usually hold these huge tablets while we're using them, but actually most of the time, we're using a tablet, we're sitting it down somewhere. It's like propped up or it's in a folio case. I don't think my iPad Pro has left its folio case in like a year. I agree 100%, which is why it's really disappointing when I tell you that the Galaxy Tab unfortunately doesn't have an included kickstand to start, and this kickstand is part of a $350 accessory that comes with the keyboard. Now, we'll talk about whether that keyboard is worth it later. Actually, I'll tell you now, nothing is worth $350, but I'll tell you about the quality later. Right now, I can tell you that this kickstand is absolutely very, very valuable to the experience of using the Galaxy Tab. I wouldn't really want to use this just in my hands or holding it up 24 seven. And so I appreciate the kickstand, which is super sturdy and super slim. So it doesn't add a lot of bulk to the tablet itself, even with the included keyboard. Now, frankly, with the included keyboard, it's comparable to the, the thickness of the Surface Pro 8 or the iPad Pro 12.9 inch. It's all three of them are within a few enough millimeters that you won't notice the difference in your bag. But the footprint all in is significantly larger than any other tablet and any 13 inch laptop that I have around. So this isn't quite as portable as you might think. Now that keyboard, unlike the Surface Pro's keyboard, doesn't actually snap and hold against the front of the tablet, meaning that the footprint is substantially larger than the Surface Pro. And so when the kickstand is out and the keyboard is out, you've got a larger footprint than you would have with most other laptops. 
So I don't think I'd really be able to fit this on, for example, an airplane uh, tray table. Other than that, there's really not a lot to say about the design. It's just a display in a metal frame, and that display is incredible. This is by far the best display that I've ever experienced on a tablet. Yes, it's larger than most other tablet displays, but the deep blacks of the OLED and the 120 Hertz means that this is smooth, crisp, and so, so colorful. So obviously watching Netflix or Hulu in the dark is incredibly great on this display, and it gives you a much better experience considering how much contrast the display gives off. Yes, the peak brightness is substantially lower than a lot of LCDs, so I wouldn't really recommend bringing this outside, but the more important thing for me is how good the display looks instead when it's just running through Excel files or browsing the internet, and frankly, it looks pretty decent. In fact, the display was so good that I ended up using it with several of my Windows laptops as a secondary display, and it was so much better than them that I just placed it in front of those Windows laptops screen and then used it as the primary display. Now, obviously this introduces a little bit of latency, so I wouldn't recommend gaming on it, for example, but it seemed to be pretty comparable to the experience of using Sidecar on an iPad and a MacBook. Outside of that, the experience of using the Galaxy Tab as a tablet are pretty on par for the experience of Galaxy Tabs in the past. Yes, the hardware is better, but frankly, the software really hasn't improved too much. Yes, multi-display can be helpful sometimes, but I still think multi-display or multi-window on Galaxy Tabs is not as intuitive as it is on Windows PCs, for example. And so, frankly, I frequently got confused with how I would open two apps side by side without many, many different taps, and so I didn't really default to it. The problem is, is the way that apps tend to render on Android tablets can be pretty bad at times. Twitter is the biggest example of this, where I frankly had to open it in a half of the display because otherwise it was basically unreadable. Now obviously this issue isn't just with Samsung, it's on the developers, but it will take several years before all Android applications can be in a place where the experience is just as good as it would be on a laptop or even on your phone. Otherwise, I'd say the software experience on this wasn't too far from using Android on my Galaxy Z Fold 3. Yes, it has a substantially larger display, and of course, it also has the S Pen. Now, frankly, I'm not an artist, so the S Pen has been really limited in terms of functionality for me. Yes, there are additional functions that kind of differentiate the S Pen from some other devices, but I didn't really ever find them to be faster than just using my finger for whatever the functionality was. Now, ironically, one criticism I've had in prior Galaxy Tab reviews regarding the S Pen was the inability to write directly in text fields in order to search things the same way that you might be able to do on an iPad Pro. Ironically, someone had point pointed that out in the comments that I was wrong. It was actually possible. But ironically, it's locked in some settings, so you have to actually toggle it on before it properly works. Why Samsung doesn't actually surface this function to the users immediately, I'm not quite sure. Maybe because it's still in development. But I found that it was relatively inconsistent at identifying text fields on screen. The writing and drawing experience on the S Pen was perfectly fine. Very, very smooth, very, very low latency, and the tip of the S Pen is significantly softer on the surface of the screen than that of the Apple Pencil or the Surface Pro's Slim Pen. But frankly, I actually like the feel of the Slim Pen in my hand the best. This S Pen feels still a little bit too light and too um, kind of flimsy. It's a little bit too plasticky, and I would prefer something a little bit denser and more solid feeling. But now let's get right into the actual computer features of this device, considering I was really concerned with using it as a computer replacement. Starting with the connectivity. This only has a single USB-C port for charging and data. And frankly, I'm a little bit disappointed by that. I would have loved to see a similar uh, layout to the Pixel Slate, which, just a second. The Pixel Slate, although it had its own problems, had dedicated USB-C chargers on both sides of the device towards the bottom. So if you're using it as kind of a typical tablet, then the charger could poke out from the bottom of the device rather than sticking out the top side. The bigger concern for me in using this as a computer was the connectivity and whether it would connect to various docking stations and devices. 
And I can say at work, it was unable to connect to my monitor through a dedicated docking station, but it did connect to a mouse, a keyboard, and, and any other peripherals, and it was charging. Now, when I connect it to this setup right here at home, it connects to mouse, keyboard, one of my two monitors, and it powers itself. And actually external storage devices as well, which means that you can pretty much use this docked as a typical computer. But of course, there's only one external monitor option. It mirrors the display on the DeX itself, which is quite a disappointment. It's the same issue that you have with the iPad Pro, so Samsung doesn't really have a leg up there. And frankly, if I was to really do real work for long periods of time, I would like to have multiple monitors with this device. Oh yeah, and by the way, that feature that allows the Galaxy Tab to be an external display for Windows, it also passes through touch, which is an incredible feature considering the price of touchscreen external monitors, even 1080p, I know is way too expensive. And so having that as an additional feature is very, very nice. And it helps kind of lower the cost effectively of this device. On the flip side where Samsung cheaped out was in not including a charger in the box. Now, of course, Samsung could say that this was actually an environmentally friendly action, but frankly, laptop chargers aren't nearly as kind of unanimous as phone chargers are. And I don't really have nearly as many high wattage laptop chargers sitting around my house. So I would have liked to have a dedicated one that I knew would charge the Galaxy Tab at its top rated speeds. But unfortunately, that was not in the box. And so I need to either buy another one in Amazon or through Samsung and be charged more or hope that my existing laptop chargers don't deliver too much or too little power to the Galaxy Tab. Speaking of expensive, let's talk about the Galaxy Tab's $350 accessory, the keyboard, and the kickstand. Now that kickstand magnetizes to the back of the tablet pretty solidly. It didn't really always go into place with ease. It kind of took a couple tries to get it perfectly into place, but once it was there, it wasn't moving, which leaves the whole device to be very, very sturdy. Similarly, the keyboard has enough magnetic friction on the bottom of the device that I didn't really have any problems with it falling off or disconnecting in the middle of use. The keyboard and the kickstand have a kind of pleather material, which I'm not too confident in kind of the long-term durability. I think this will wear quite a bit over time, but we'll have to see. The good news is, is in terms of spacing and layout, this is one of the best tablet keyboards that I've ever used, maybe the best just because you have so much space to type on, considering the larger footprint. All of the keys are in the right place with the dedicated function row, escape key, delete key, dedicated arrow keys, with the small exception being that there is a language switch key where the right alt key should be and a alt key where the right control key or menu key should be, but those are small gripes that probably only I care about. The actual typing feel on this keyboard is fine. There's enough travel on this so that I can actually feel what I'm typing, and I didn't get fatigued after long periods of time, but frankly, the feeling of the keys is better on the Magic Keyboard or on the Surface Pro type cover. Interestingly enough, that F row that I love so much defaults to the F keys rather than the kind of function control buttons the way it would on just about any other tablet that I've used recently. There is a dedicated function key switch to switch between them. And ironically enough, the function switch has, an, has a light as though there is a function lock functionality, but I don't actually know how to trigger that function lock functionality just by using the keyboard itself. Maybe it's buried in settings, but it's a little strange. The trackpad is significantly larger than the Magic Keyboards. It's large, smooth, responsive, and it's really bad. The biggest problem here is just how slippery it is. Now, I understand it's difficult to get the feeling of a trackpad down just right, but this one seems to have something completely wrong, and it's mostly seen in scrolling. With most other devices, when I'm scrolling down a page of text, I can pretty easily get to exactly where I need to be without overshooting or undershooting. But with the Galaxy Tab, instead I often overshoot and it gets too slippery and then I overcorrect when returning. It just is not as smooth and responsive and reliable as a Surface Pro or even the iPad Pro 12.9 inch. 
The other big issue with the trackpad is it seems to have some sort of sleep mode where it kind of turns itself off after not being used for some time and whenever you're using the keyboard. Now, palm rejection on tablets and laptops have been around for a long time. And I think it's important if the trackpad happens to be in a place where you're rubbing your palms against it while typing. But this seemed to be pretty extreme where I had my left hand on the alt tab, for example, and while I was controlling with the trackpad with my right hand, and the trackpad just would not work while I was doing that. It wasn't until I basically took my hand off the keyboard after using alt tab that it would then work again. And as someone who frequently switches very, very quickly between the keyboard and the trackpad, waiting that extra second or two for the trackpad to kind of wake up was very, very frustrating. Now let's talk about Dex, which probably deserves a video of its own, but considering I spent probably 80% of the time using this device in Dex, I think it really fits the experience of this tablet. It defines what the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra is and how it differentiates itself from the iPad Pro, for example. Now, Dex is still very much in development. It still feels like it's a newer operating system. I've heard a lot of comparisons to the Chrome OS, which I totally understand because both of them feel more like operating systems that were designed in the last 10 years rather than the last 30. This could be viewed as both a criticism and a compliment. The criticism being that they still feel significantly feature incomplete, but they do feel a lot more modern than the experience of using Windows, for example. I have a long list of comments on the experience of using Dex, and the organization might be a little bit confusing, but let's start when you first log into Dex and maybe you're opening up an application from the search menu. Similar to Windows, you can search for an application just by pressing the command, in this case key, and searching for the application. But then when you actually see the application you want, you can't simply press enter in order to open the application. Instead, you have to hit tab twice, then hit enter before you can open the application. Small gripe, but let's keep on going. If you then want to, for example, change a Bluetooth setting, then you could, on Windows, hypothetically type in Bluetooth, and then it will navigate you to the portion of the settings menu dedicated to Bluetooth connections. That's not the case here. Instead, you specifically have to search for the settings app, and then once you're in the settings app, you can then search for your Bluetooth settings which is just one extra layer of complication. You return to your home screen after opening up your application, and there the new application is as this relatively small window taking up kind of the middle of the display. Samsung's just hitting you in the face and saying, look, this is a desktop experience. We can do Windows too. But frankly, I don't really ever use a window like this. Instead, I'm always using it either in full screen or snapped to either side of the device. Every application will open up in a default window like this until you actually snap it to the top or sides. That can get so frustrating over time. And the bigger frustration for me is the fact that when I exit dex mode to, for example, watch YouTube for a little bit and then go back into dex mode, all of the applications that I had positioned perfectly on my display will be returned to this same layout. That being said, I'm still very appreciative of the fact that snapping windows on either side of the screen works perfectly. I saw some comments in an older Mac OS video where some user said that the reason that Mac OS doesn't have snapping feature is that Windows has some patent on it. But I'm not sure if I've ever really verified that, and this would seem to indicate otherwise. Considering the snapping feature works both with touching the screen and using command arrow keys in order to snap it to either side. So after I realized I could control apps the same way that I do on my desktop, I immediately opened all of the apps I could, started playing around with them, only to be disappointed to realize that despite the experience seeming like a Windows experience, Android apps don't really tailor themselves to be a great experience here. It just isn't nearly as seamless with a lot of keyboard shortcuts, for example, not working through applications, and the experience being significantly better through web apps. So instead, I ended up switching to web apps very, very early and using web apps instead. Now granted, I do the same thing on my iPad Pro. Even though there's a dedicated application for Instagram, for example, I find myself using the web application for those apps a lot more often. 
I would love to see Samsung's internet be able to support being able to open applications by default in the web app rather than the Android app. And granted, Chrome does give you that op optionality here, but ironically enough, after quite a few hours of experimenting and trying out Chrome, Samsung Internet, and Edge, I found that Samsung Internet has the best experience of using this. Not only was it the fastest, but also it was most capable in terms of keyboard shortcuts. And it was the most likely to default consistently to the desktop view rather than switching back to a mobile view. Frankly, Chrome is still very much a mobile experience here, and so you won't get a lot of the same features that you would get on a desktop experience. I would love for Google to bring a Chrome desktop experience over to this tablet, but I don't know if they'll ever do so. Samsung Internet does have some ad blocking features and some add-ons, all of nine, I think it is. Maybe those are the perfect add-ons for you, but I would love to be able to have full access to Chrome add-ons through this device. Another limitation of Samsung Internet is that you can only have five applications open at any time. And while that might seem kind of excessive, if you have, say, 15 tabs in each window, unfortunately, I was using all of those tabs as dedicated individual apps that I could easily switch to with Alt-Tab. So I had a dedicated window for OneNote. I had a dedicated window for Google Sheets. had a dedicated window for eBay. And then I would Alt-Tab between them. But unfortunately, Samsung doesn't really optimize that experience considering you could only have five at any time. Disclaimer, I'm about to use the phrase real work, which frankly is a misnomer. Real work for a developer is different than real work for an Instagram influencer. Real work for a creator is different than a real work for an accountant. And so for that reason, whenever a creator or anyone else uses the phrase real work, it might mean a lot of different things. But let me tell you my common definition of my own real work. Considering I have a lot of experience in finance, accounting, and numbers, a lot of my day is spent in Microsoft Excel and other spreadsheet applications. Any Excel junkie will tell you that Microsoft Office for tablets or even for Mac OS is nowhere near the experience that you get on Windows 10 or Windows 11. Yes, there is a lot of the functionality that's slowly being ported in, but the experience, the keyboard shortcuts, none of that stuff is really here yet. And so instead, I found myself opting, opting for Microsoft Office Online, which ironically has better keyboard support than the Office app. That also has its own frustrations. My final solution was Google Sheets, which is frankly sacrilegious in the Microsoft Excel community. Most Excel nerds will tell you that Google Sheets has nowhere near the functionality that you'd get in a desktop version of Microsoft Excel, but I can tell you with several years of experience in Google Sheets that with enough practice, you can get pretty darn capable in it. Now, I use Google Sheets every day for many, many years time, and I was very, very impressed with how capable it could get, and I was surprised with just how well I could use Google Sheets on this product it really enabled me to build substantial, extensive financial models in minutes the same way that I would on a desktop version of Microsoft Office on my Microsoft Surface Pro. Was it perfect? No, it was far from it, but it was substantially closer to a desktop-like experience than I've ever been able to get on my iPad Pro 12.9 inch using any application. In no particular order, here's a quick lightning round of other frustrations that I had with the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra running DeX. You can't select text in Outlook, OneNote, or several web apps that I tried to use. The Alt Tab menu shows way fewer applications than any other operating system, so I often found myself jumping far back to find the app that I wanted to open. There's no proper file explorer, so I'd opt for online storage for most of my documents. Occasionally, some links will wrap me back to the Android application for things rather than the web application, even though I would prefer using the web application. There's no support for multiple desktops like Windows, Mac OS, and Chrome OS all have. I would love to see widgets on my Dex desktop, but it's not an option. And in what I assume was a memory-saving operation, YouTube would stop playing when I switched away from a browser window into another browser window, even though YouTube was being played in the web browser and not in the YouTube application. The YouTube application, ironically enough, would keep YouTube playing considering I have YouTube Premium. So it was just a weird bug or maybe a memory issue. 
Outside of those gripes, what has kept me in the past from using iPad OS, Chrome OS at times, and Android as my primary desktop operating system? Ironically, more times than not, it's the keyboard experience. Chrome OS has caught up in recent years, but the shortcuts are still a little bit unique. The iPad Pro technically has some keyboard shortcuts, but it seems like it always wants you to tap the screen in order to do most of the things that you need to do. And then Android support for keyboard shortcuts has historically been very bad until the DeX experience. DeX comes closer than any other device to actually a true Windows-like desktop user experience in terms of keyboard shortcuts. Window controls, switching between tabs in the browser, opening new tabs, closing new tabs, opening new applications, anything along those lines are handled completely well in the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra. Many web apps are given the ability to stretch their legs as though they were desktop applications just because they have full access to the keyboard. But Samsung commits one of the biggest cardinal sins that the iPad ironically makes in removing the escape button. But wait, in OISO, you might say, didn't you say that there's a full function row and a full escape button the same way that you'd get on Windows? Yes, the escape key is there, but unfortunately it doesn't function like an escape key. Instead, it functions like a back button. For some reason, I don't understand why, every single application in DeX responds to the escape key by going a previous page. If you are opening a brand new application from scratch and you press the back button or the escape button, you are taken out of the application, which is just horrible. And oddly enough, this happens to all keyboards connected to the Galaxy Tab. So even if you had a full fat keyboard like this and you were trying to use it on your Galaxy Tab, when using it in DeX, this will function as a back button. It won't function as an escape key. I don't understand why, but ironically enough, the iPad has a similar feature, but the escape key instead functions as a home button. So it always goes home. This instead just goes to the previous page, which you could hypothetically get around if you go to a web page and then you refresh it hundreds of times, then at least you're not losing your progress because you're just going to be taken back to the same page. But it's still very frustrating. But it's Android, right? This isn't lockdown iOS where you're not able to customize your keyboard. This is Android where you can customize anything you want. No, for some reason, no, I tried to install several applications that allow you to customize keyboard buttons the same way that you would customize your volume keys to do different things. And for whatever reason, when you enter DeX, you are forced to use the Samsung keyboard software or the Samsung keyboard even on screen. And so the escape key will instantly be remapped to the back button, even if you had hypothetically programmed it to do something else. The reason why this is such a big deal is most of the applications that I use on a daily basis actually need the escape key for normal functionality. So Microsoft Excel is a great example where the escape key is used to exit out of a cell that you are modifying without modifying it. And so if you realize that you don't actually have to change a cell's formula, you can hit the escape key, but not on DeX. Instead, that will take you to the previous web page. In Google Sheets, it's the same functionality, but ironically, the Google Sheets functionality takes you to the previous web page, which is often a tab within the same workbook. So the experience was a little bit better. Now, all of this commentary on DeX is outside of the massive amount of bugs that I experienced on a daily basis. But frankly, I gave the Galaxy Tab a lot more slack than I would a Windows laptop or a Mac OS laptop, because otherwise, I wouldn't be able to even review this. And I was willing to sacrifice my little bit of frustration in order to try and get this to really function as a desktop operating system. But I wouldn't feel confident using this as my daily driver for work because there's too much of a likelihood that things would just fall apart at the seams and I wouldn't have a solution when times got tough. You might have noticed that we're nearing the end of this review and I haven't talked at all about the actual performance of the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra. Well, a lot of angry TikTok commenters came to me and said that the Galaxy Tab is trash because it's nowhere near the performance of the iPad Pro. But frankly, what's the point of all that horsepower if all you're gonna do is drive in a straight line? I think that's a metaphor that fits. I don't know cars. 
Despite the Galaxy Tab's comparatively worse performance than the iPad Pro, it's allowed to stretch its legs quite a bit more because of DeX, because I was able to have significantly more applications open, apps weren't closed in RAM nearly as much as my experience with the iPad Pro, and while there aren't nearly as many professional applications, web applications are getting really, really good and a lot more preferable on the Galaxy Tab than the iPad Pro. That being said, this still doesn't feel like a desktop experience in terms of performance. There were several instances that applications closed in the background, even after a couple minutes of not using them. Now, this could be for memory preservation, and it could be also because I had always kept applications open in the background rather than naturally closing them like I do on most Windows laptops. But I was still a little bit disappointed considering this has 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of base storage, which is better specs than most of the devices that I've used and reviewed in the last year. Now, since I was using Galaxy Tab as a computer, I would say my battery life was pretty comparable to most thin and light laptops that I reviewed in the last couple of years, in that I could get through a workday, but not much more. And the standby performance in terms of battery life was probably worse than the iPad Pro and probably better than the Surface Pro 8. And that's where I start to wonder about some of the design decisions that Samsung decided to make. Yes, this is a astoundingly thin device and incredibly light for how large it is, but I wouldn't really mind having a couple more millimeters of thickness in order to have a larger battery. Especially considering, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I don't really often hold this device up in my hands too often, instead frequently just setting it down and using it like a laptop. But why do I need to replace my laptop with a tablet? What is driving me to do so when I usually have a great experience with most of the Windows devices that I review here? Well, as long as Microsoft is continuing to fail, in my eyes, at making a good tablet experience for the Surface Pro 8, and as long as Apple is committed to separating their Mac OS and their iPad lines, making the iPad, unfortunately, kind of bottlenecked in its capabilities, there's no real good medium and no real good one device that can cover my tablet and my laptop experience. And so the concept of the Galaxy Tab S8 was very, very exciting for me. I have a number of family members now that just have an iPad as their only device or just have a Chromebook as their only device. And generally, when they're done doing their taxes and Google Sheets, they're able to switch to Netflix and have a great browsing and tablet experience. Technically, you can get a similar experience out of the Surface Pro, just kind of flipped the opposite direction. But neither of those experiences feel non-compromised to me. I feel like you are still giving up an experience of a good tablet on the Windows side and giving up the experience of a good laptop on the iPad side. And so the Galaxy Tab S8 is ironically the closest I've ever gotten to a real tablet experience that could somehow bridge the gap. Now I know as a power user, I'm less likely to be able to switch to a tablet like the Galaxy Tab and have it cover all the bases to be my primary device. Because I use so many different applications that have a tendency to rely on old x86 based processors. But I would argue that a lot of other Android users that are in the market for a $1,300 device are probably also enthusiasts and power users that will need significantly more capabilities. So that leaves me in this weird recommendation corner where I don't know exactly who this device is for. I would say the best recommendation that I could possibly have is similar to my recommendation for the Surface Pro X. For those who have a existing desktop or you know big laptop that they don't wanna lug around, this could be a good on the go device to kind of cover the mobile side of computing that they might need. It is an incredibly capable device on the road, and it's great for you know typical browsing or tablet experience. But I wouldn't say that this could be a easy catch-all, you know, a do-it-all device, the same way that a Surface Pro 8 would be able to. The result of a couple weeks with the Galaxy Tab S8 leave me cautiously optimistic about the future of Android tablets. There's a lot of places that Android can go from here, and with hopefully with Android 12L, we'll see more and more functionality brought over and a better 
tablet experience. But it's not going to happen tomorrow, and it's going to take some time. And most importantly, it's going to take both the chicken and the egg. It will require more tablets to be sold, and it will require the developers to come over and actually commit to the Android operating system on tablets, which has never been easy for Google or Android in the past. Before we wrap up, I just want to say that this was a $1,200 tablet with a $350 keyboard accessory. That is an absurd amount of money that could get you a M1 MacBook Pro or maybe an M1 Pro MacBook Pro on deep discounts or used, or maybe a very, very high-end Surface Pro 8. All of that, frankly, would be a significantly better all-around device than this. I don't know if Samsung really has a market here considering just how much they might have priced it out, especially the keyboard. The keyboard, trackpad, and kickstand are absolutely ridiculous. And the reason I say that is specifically because I'm still married to the idea of a $130 Surface type cover. Maybe that's going away, but this is just way too expensive for what is a middling actual keyboard experience. Thank you for watching Inoiso. I hope you like this coverage of the Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra. Based off the script, this is likely to be the longest review that I've ever done, but it's because this device was just so meaningful and gave me so many feelings. And I'm hoping that it's received well. But in case I didn't cover anything that you were particularly concerned about, be sure to ask it down in the comments. Thanks for watching, I hope you liked this video. If you did, be sure to get subscribed because I've got more videos covering the new Galaxy devices coming soon.